Chapter 3 of Science of Being Well. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jill Preston. Science of Being Well by Wallace D. Waddles. Chapter 3 Life and Its Organisms. The human body is the abiding place of an energy which renews it when worn, which eliminates waste or poisonous matter, and which repairs the body when broken or injured. This energy we call life. Life is not generated or produced within the body. It produces the body. The seed which has been kept in the storehouse for years will grow when planted in the soil. It will produce a plant. But the life in the plant is not generated by its growing. It is the life which makes the plant grow. The performance of function does not cause life. It is life which causes function to be performed. Life is first, function afterward. It is life which distinguishes organic from inorganic matter but it is not produced after the organization of matter. Life is the principle or force which causes organization. It builds organisms. It is a principle or force inherent in original substance. All life is one. This life principle of the all is the principle of health in man and becomes constructively active whenever man thinks in a certain way. Whoever therefore thinks in this certain way will surely have perfect health if his external functioning is in conformity with his thought. But the external functioning must conform to the thought. Man cannot hope to be well by thinking health if he eats, drinks, breathes, and sleeps like a sick man. The universal life principle, then, is the principle of health in man. It is one with original substance. There is one original substance from which all things are made. This substance is alive, and its life is the principle of life, the universe. This substance has created from itself all the forms of organic life by thinking them, or by thinking the motions and functions which produce them. Original substance thinks only health, because it knows all truth. There is no truth which is not known in the formless, which is all, and in all. It is not only knows all truth, but it has all power. Its vital power is the source of all the energy there is. A conscious life which knows all truth, and which has all power, cannot go wrong or perform function imperfectly, knowing all it knows. Too much to go wrong, and so the formless cannot be diseased or think diseased. Man is a form of this original substance and has a separate consciousness of his own, but his consciousness is limited and therefore imperfect. By reason of his limited knowledge, man can and does think wrongly, and so he causes perverted and imperfect functioning in his own body. Man has not known too much to go wrong. The diseased or imperfect functioning may not instantly result from an imperfect thought, but it is bound to come if the thought becomes habitual. Any thought continuously held by man tends to the establishment of the corresponding condition in his body. Also, man has failed to learn how to perform the voluntary functions of his life in a healthy way. He does not know when, what, and how to eat. He knows little about breathing and less about sleep. He does all these things in a wrong way and under wrong condition and this because he has neglected to follow the only sure guide to the knowledge of life. He has tried to live by logic rather than by instinct. He has made living a matter of art and not of nature, and he has gone wrong. His only remedy is to begin to go right, and this he can surely do. It is the work of this book to teach the whole truth, so that the man who reads it shall know too much to go wrong. The thoughts of disease produce the forms of disease. Man must learn to think health and be an original substance, which takes the form of its thought. He will become the form of health and manifest perfect health and all his functioning. 
The people who were healed by touching the bones of the saint were really healed by thinking in a certain way, and not by any power emanating from the relics. There is no healing power in the bones of dead men, whether they be those of saint or sinner. The people who were healed by the doses of either the allopath or the homeopath were also really healed by thinking in a certain way. There is no drug which has within itself the power to heal disease. The people who have been healed by prayers and affirmations were also healed by thinking in a certain way. There is no curative power in strings of words. All the sick who have been healed by whatsoever system have thought in a certain way, and a little examination will show us what this way is. The two essentials of the way are faith and a personal application of the faith. The people who touched the saints' bones had faith, and so great was their faith that in the instant they touched the relics, they severed all mental relations with disease and mentally unified themselves with health. This change of mind was accompanied by an intense devotional feeling which penetrated to the deepest recesses of their souls and so aroused the principle of health to powerful action. By faith they claimed that they were healed or appropriated health to themselves, and in full faith they ceased to think of themselves in connection with disease and thought of themselves only in connection with health. These are the two essentials to thinking in the certain way which will make you well. First, claim or appropriate health by faith, and second, sever all mental relations with disease and enter into mental relations with health. That which we make ourselves mentally, we become physically, and that with which we unite ourselves mentally, we become unified with physically. If your thought always relates you to disease, then your thought becomes a fixed power to cause disease within you. And if your thought always relates you to health, then your thought becomes a fixed power exerted to keep you well. In the case of the people who are healed by medicine, the result is obtained in the same way. They have, consciously or unconsciously, sufficient faith in the means used to cause them to sever mental relations with disease and enter into mental relations with health. Faith may be unconscious. It is possible for us to have a subconscious or inbred faith in things like medicine, in which we do not believe to any extent objectively, and this subconscious faith may be quite sufficient to quicken the principle of health into constructive activity. Many who have little conscious faith are healed in this way, while many others who have great faith in the means are not healed, because they do not make the personal application to themselves. Their faith is general, but not specific for their own cases. In the science of being well, we have two main points to consider. First, how to think with faith, and second, how to so apply the thought to ourselves as to quicken the principle of health into constructive activity. We begin by learning what to think. End of Chapter 3 Recording by Jill Preston Chapter 4 of Science of Being Well This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jill Preston. Science of Being Well by Wallace D. Waddles. Chapter 4. What to Think. In order to sever all mental relations with disease, you must enter into mental relations with health, making the process positive, not negative, one of assumption, not of rejection. You are to receive or appropriate health rather than to reject and deny disease. Denying disease accomplishes next to nothing. It does little good to cast out the devil and leave the house vacant, for he will presently return with others worse than himself. When you enter into full and constant mental relations with health, you must of necessity seize all relationship with disease. The first step in the science of being well is then to enter into complete thought connection with health. The best way to do this is to form a mental image 
or picture of yourself as being well, imagining a perfectly strong and healthy body, and to spend sufficient time in contemplating this image to make it your habitual thought of yourself. This is not so easy as it sounds. It necessitates the taking of considerable time for meditation, and not all persons have the imaging faculty well enough developed to form a distinct mental picture of themselves in a perfect or idolized body. It is much easier, as in the science of getting rich, to form a mental image of the things one wants to have. For we have seen these things, or their counterparts, and know how they look. We can picture them very easily from memory, but we have never seen ourselves in a perfect body, and a clear mental image is hard to form. It is not necessary or essential, however, to have a clear mental image of yourself as you wish to be. It is only essential to form a conception of perfect health and to relate yourself to it. This conception of health is not a mental picture of a particular thing. It is an understanding of health and carries with it the idea of perfect functioning in every part and organ. You may try to picture yourself as perfect in physique, that helps, and you must think of yourself as doing everything in the manner of a perfectly strong and healthy person. You can picture yourself as walking down the street with an erect body and a vigorous stride. You can picture yourself as doing your day's work easily and with surplus vigor, never tired or weak. You can picture in your mind how all things would be done by a person full of health and power, and you can make yourself the central figure in the picture doing things in just that way. Never think of the ways in which weak or sickly people do things. Always think of the way strong people do things. Spend your leisure time in thinking about the strong way until you have a good conception of it. And always think of yourself in connection with the strong way of doing things. This is what I mean by having a conception of health. In order to establish perfect functioning in every part, Man does not have to study anatomy or physiology so that he can form a mental image of each separate organ and address himself to it. He does not have to treat his liver, his kidneys, his stomach, or his heart. There is one principle of health in man which has control over all the involuntary functions of his life, and the thought of perfect health impressed upon this principle will reach each part and organ. Man's liver is not controlled by a liver principle his stomach by a digestive principle, and so on. The principle of health is one. The less you go into the detailed study of physiology, the better for you. Our knowledge of this science is very imperfect and leads to imperfect thought. Imperfect thought causes imperfect functioning, which is disease. Let me illustrate. Until quite recently, physiology fixed 10 days as the extreme limit of man's endurance without food. It was considered that only in exceptional cases could he survive a longer fast. So the impression became universally disseminated that one who was deprived of food must die in from five to ten days. And numbers of people, when cut off from food by shipwreck, accident, or famine, did die within this period. But the performances of Dr. Tanner, the 40-day faster, and the writings of Dr. Dewey and others on the fasting cure, together with the experiments of numberless people who have fasted for 40 to 60 days, have shown that man's ability to live without food is vastly greater than had been supposed. Any person properly educated can fast from 20 to 40 days with little loss in weight and often with no apparent loss of strength at all. The people who starved to death in 10 days or less did so because they believed that death was inevitable. An erroneous physiology had given them a wrong thought about themselves. When a man is deprived of food, he will die in from 10 to 50 days, according to the way he has been taught, or, in other words, according to the way he thinks about it. So you see that an erroneous physiology can work very mischievous results. No science of being well can be founded on current physiology. It is not sufficiently exact in its knowledge. With all its pretensions, 
comparatively little is really known as to the interior workings and processes of the body. It is not known just how food is digested. It is not known just what part food plays, if any, in the generation of force. It is not known exactly what the liver, spleen, and pancreas are for, or what part their secretions play in the chemistry of assimilation. On all these and most other points we theorize, but we do not really know. When man begins to study physiology, he enters the domain of theory and disputation. He comes among conflicting opinions, and he is bound to form mistaken ideas concerning himself. These mistaken ideas lead to the thinking of wrong thoughts, and this leads to perverted functioning and disease. All that the most perfect knowledge of physiology could do for man would be to enable him to think only thoughts of perfect health and to eat, drink, breathe, and sleep in a perfectly healthy way. And this, as we shall show, he can do without studying physiology at all. This, for the most part, is true of all hygiene. There are certain fundamental propositions which we should know and these will be explained in later chapters. But aside from these propositions, ignore physiology and hygiene. They tend to fill your mind with thoughts of imperfect conditions, and these thoughts will produce the imperfect conditions in your own body. You cannot study any science which recognizes disease if you are to think nothing but health. Drop all investigation as to your present condition, its causes, or possible results, and set yourself to the work of forming a conception of health. Think about health and the possibilities of health, of the work that may be done and the pleasures that may be enjoyed in a condition of perfect health. Then make this conception your guide in thinking of yourself. Refuse to entertain for an instant any thought of yourself which is not in harmony with it. When any idea of disease or imperfect functioning enters your mind, Cast it out instantly by calling upon a thought which is in harmony with the conception of health. Think of yourself at all times as realizing conception, as being a strong and perfectly healthy personage, and do not harbor a contrary thought. Know that as you think of yourself in unity with this conception, the original substance which permeates and fills the tissues of your body is taking form according to the thought, and know that this intelligent substance or mind stuff will cause function to be performed in such a way that your body will be rebuilt with perfectly healthy cells. The intelligent substance from which all things are made permeates and penetrates all things, and so it is in and through your body. It moves according to its thoughts, and so if you hold only the thought the perfectly healthy function it will cause the movements of perfectly healthy function within you. Hold with persistence to the thought of perfect health in relation to yourself. Do not permit yourself to think in any other way. Hold this thought with perfect faith that it is the fact, the truth. It is the truth so far as your mental body is concerned. You have a mind body and a physical body. The mind body takes form just as you think of yourself, and any thought which you hold continuously is made visible by the transformation of the physical body into its image. Implanting the thought of perfect functioning in the mind body will, in due time, cause perfect functioning in the physical body. The transformation of the physical body into the image of the ideal held by the mind body is not accomplished instantaneously. We cannot transfigure our physical bodies as well as Jesus did. In the creation and recreation of forms, substance moves along the fixed lines of growth it has established, and the impression upon it of the health thought causes the healthy body to be built cell by cell. Holding only thoughts of perfect health will ultimately cause perfect functioning, and perfect functioning will in due time produce a perfectly healthy body. It may be as well to condense this chapter into a syllabus. Your physical body is permeated and fitted with an intelligent substance which forms a body of mind stuff. This mind stuff 
controls the functioning of your physical body. A thought of disease or of imperfect function impressed upon the mind stuff causes disease or imperfect functioning in the physical body. If you are diseased, it is because wrong thoughts have made impressions on this mind stuff. These may have been either your own thoughts or those of your parents. We begin life with many subconscious impressions, both right and wrong. But the natural tendency of all mind is toward health. And if no thoughts are held in the conscious mind, save those of health, all internal functioning will come to be performed in a perfectly healthy manner. The power of nature within you is sufficient to overcome all hereditary impressions. And if you will learn to control your thoughts so that you shall think only those of health, and if you will perform the voluntary functions of life in a perfectly healthy way, you can certainly be well. End of chapter four. Recording by Jill Preston.